Okay, uh, real quick, I've got a whole playlist on the Bema Seat rewards and probably more messages besides. I probably taught 20 hours on the Bema Seat. Uh, if you've been tracking with me and you have a kind of a full spectrum view of what I teach, you can't say that I teach that there is no reward. Um, but it's one of those things where you, uh, it's a nuanced topic and a lot of these things are really nuanced topics and to present it in any other way is unfair. Uh, when people try to condense everything to the most simplest explanation that just give me a one sentence, I, I literally get people that will comment on an hour video. Can you just sum it up in one sentence? I can sum the Bible up in one sentence. Can't you sum up your point of view in one sentence? Well, you know, Paul, when he wrote Ephesians, spoke some of the longest sentences in the human language <laughs> to describe terms that people study for years to uh, fully understand. It, you know, we are not to be babes in our understanding, and some of these topics require nuance. And this is where doctrine requires, you know, to, to uh, be a workman that not need not be ashamed you need to be a diligent student rightly dividing the word of truth and spend time in it a lot of times i'll get questions can you tell me what's the easiest bible to read just starting with the bible no um honestly king james is the best bible to read your aversion to the king james is because of the these and the thous but the bible is not meant to be super easy to read and all the translations that are sold under the guise of being easier to read are corrupted translations based on uh, corrupted manuscripts that have Gnostic inserts like the N NIV and all, all these paraphrases that were uh, derived from the Alexandrian manuscripts. The reason the King James is so solid is because it's from the Textus Receptus, which people paid blood to, to and were persecuted and killed for getting that thing translated into our languages uh so the king james there's an integrity to it there's an anointing in it too that i it i, I after reading so many translations for so many years i finally said you know what there's uh, there's a food in the king james yes there is an archaic language there but uh at least i'm getting the accurate word it's easier to understand the accurate word than it is to understand the so-called easy to understand translations that are inaccurate that lead you to wrong conclusions and then you have to unlearn everything you unlearned i mean how much of our boy how much how many conversations have i had where people have unlearned whole doctrinal systems and had to untangle their theological understanding simply because they were reading from bad translations that were inaccurate because they were easier to read supposedly well, that's how this is. You know, when you distill a concept like reward down into a bite-sized nugget, you know, a little chart, okay, you, you get a paycheck and an inheritance. It's not that hard to understand. <laughs> no, that is incoherent. Um, so when we speak to it, we do speak in pieces, and you have to really study the matter. Uh, so, you know, in the last message, that I talked about, you may come away thinking that I teach, based on solely that message, that there is no reward. And that is not true. The point is that the rewards in the New Testament economy are not based on a carrot stick wage slash punishment system. They're not tethered to the law. And a lot of people have hijacked, well Christianity, has hijacked the notion of scriptural rewards and reattach them to the law and it's just another way to bring people under the law. If they could bring you under law for justification, they would. But since they can't, they'll do it this way. You know, the, the Lordshippers, we know how to spot them. We say they don't even believe in justification. That's why they're not in the community. But the enemy's more uh, interested in infiltrating creeping in unaware, bringing in Daniel heresies in the guise of the true doctrine. That's what he wants to do. 
So he comes in under the guise of the saving gospel and brings in law um, by attaching it to other things. Okay, yeah, eternal salvation, sure, that's a given. We're all going to heaven, but let's talk about your living. That's by works. And there's a reward. You want a reward, don't you? Or there's a blessing. The charismatics talk about blessings. You want blessings in your Christian life, don't you? Well, that comes from obedience. So then they separate the Christian life from justification and separate blessings uh, from the Spirit, which is the blessing of the gospel, and make it a matter of uh, something you work for, like you put God in your debt, and it's no longer of grace, it's of works. And they, they once you've combined works and grace and tried to fuse those two systems together, you're, you are spinning out heresy. Uh, now, the, the rewards one is even more subtle because the best grace defenders do it, you know. Uh, the ones who will defend justification very well for, for, you know, eternal salvation will then turn and teach that, well, but reward, now that is by works, you know. And they'll teach about the five crowns and the different things. Now, there are, the, the problem is that there are rewards put in front of us in the scriptures both under the wage system and under grace so you have to learn how to distinguish between law and gospel first and distinguish what is the wage system and what is grace how do i know which system is is being referred to here and that's not something you're going to learn from somebody's chart uh in 30 seconds this takes diligent study um take these glasses off for a second the other thing is that uh, you know, grace is, there, there's three not I but statements. There's not I but Christ in me in Galatians 2. And then there's not I but the sin that dwells in me in Romans 7. But then there's not I but the grace of God in me. And that's what Paul talks about in Corinthians when he says, I work more than they all, yet not I but the grace of God in me. And that, in, in each of those situations, he's got, He's talking about another principle at operation in him that produces results. Sin produces fruit unto death, okay? And yet it's not I, but the sin, the principle of sin that dwells in me, okay? But the Christian life, uh, which brings me into the presence of God and allows me to live as a son and an heir, is not I, but Christ in me, the spirit of sonship. I've been crucified with Christ. I died to the law. Uh, nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ in me. The life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. If you don't see that as the base of the Christian life, then you can't even talk about rewards in grace because you don't know what grace is. Grace is coming out from I uh, and seeing that it is not I, but Christ. That's the beginning because grace is a person, which is God himself in Christ, giving himself to you as life. And that brings you into a new sphere called the body of Christ where you are no longer just you working for a taskmaster where he is up there in heaven and you're here on earth, but you are a member of Christ. You are part of the body and uh, you are a co-heir together with Christ and you, are, uh, you have his life and he's working in you. And the way we live the Christian life is by participating in that reality. There, if you participate, if you do not participate in that reality, you are living in the flesh and you're doing works of the flesh. Even if they're religious works, they're dead works and they need to be repented of. They're not going to produce anything that lasts. They're not going to produce any fruit. You're not sowing unto eternal life. And everything you're building, if you want to call it, and if you want to put it in the light of rewards, is wood, hay, and stubble and will therefore be burned and you'll suffer the loss of those things. Uh, so we want to live not as children of the flesh, but children of the promise. We want to live not as Ishmael in the, according to the flesh, but Isaac by faith through the supply of the spirit as Christ becomes our life. And then that brings us into the place where we can actually talk about service. So Galatians precedes Ephesians. Galatians talks about the Christian life, which is a matter of not I, but Christ. But then Ephesians talks about the Christian service, which is the building up of the body of Christ, the new Jerusalem, which is the inheritance of God and of the saints. 
which is the city whose builder and maker is God and the house over which Christ the Son is faithful. And yet, Paul said, I as a wise master builder in, in Corinthians um, laid a foundation, but no other foundation can be laid but that which is laid, Jesus Christ. And then everybody needs to take heed how they build. It's the vision in Ephesians that tells us what he's talking about in Corinthians. Um, Ephesians comes after Galatians. Galatians is the beginning, which is not I but Christ. If you don't have Galatians, you cannot see service. If you don't seek life, you don't see service. You're not going to be able to serve God if you don't know how to live before God. So not I but Christ is how we live, but then how do we serve? I work more than they all, yet not I, but the grace of Christ in me. And when it comes to rewards, they are reckoned not as of works, but of grace. We learn that in Romans 4, which tells us that the reward is reckoned not of debt, not of works, but of grace. So it's not just the inheritance, but it's also the reward. And what you discover is that the reward and the inheritance are they're not so much interchangeable, but they're closely related. Uh, Colossians says that you are um, called to receive the reward of the inheritance. And, of course, in, in Genesis 15, where justification secured, through faith secured Abraham's inheritance, and God confirmed the inheritance to Abraham's seed, which is Christ, he said, Fear not, Abraham, for I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. Christ is ultimately our reward, and he is the reward rewarder of those who seek him. Okay, that's what it says when it talks about the reward of Enoch, who walked, who, who found, he was found that he pleased God and he was not. God took him because he had this testimony that he pleased God, for without faith it is impossible to please God, for he that uh, seek, he that pleases God or must, uh, must believe that he is a rewarder. He, he, he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. See, there's a reward which is higher than every other reward, which is Christ himself. And Paul talked about Christ himself being the prize of the Christian life, and he was seeking, according to Philippians 3, to gain him, to be found in him and to gain him, and he called him the prize of the upward calling, uh, the mark of the upward calling. The goal of the Christian life is to pursue him and to gain him. And that word pursue there is even like persecute. It's like you are restlessly persecuting Christian, uh, Christ, I'm sorry, to gain him, to be found in him, and to know him in the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings. Uh, to know him, the excellency of the knowledge of Christ, everything else is dung compared to that. Okay, so this is uh, what Paul really had before him was Christ himself as a goal to pursue the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And Peter said that an abundant entrance into the kingdom is furnished through the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And we're to be fruitful in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Um, and faith and service is related to coming to Jesus Christ and being renewed in the knowledge of him. I beseech you, therefore, by the mercies of God, that you present yourself as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is your reasonable service of worship. And be not conformed to this world, but by, be renewed by the tra uh, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It is to grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, presenting ourselves to Him, coming to Him in His acceptance of us as a living sacrifice in the death and resurrection of Christ on the altar, presenting ourselves to God, and then being transformed to know Him through the renewing of our mind. The new man is put on through renewing by the knowledge of him who created in the after the uh who created him in the image uh of true righteousness and holiness, right? With the, the we are renewed in the knowledge of him and that has to do, believe it or not, with service and reward. There is a pursuit of the knowledge of Jesus Christ that is the prize of the Christian life. Uh and is our crown. And this knowledge becomes in us a weight of glory, which is the material for God's building, which is the new city Jerusalem, which is the church, which is the habitation of God, and is the material that we as stewards in God's house build with. 
So it's the it's called the unsearchable riches of Christ and the revelation of the mystery. When Paul talks about his ministry in Ephesians 3, he talks about how he's been given a dispensation of the grace of God for the Gentiles to reveal a mystery, the mystery of Christ, and bring us into the knowledge of the mystery of Christ, the unsearchable riches of Christ. Uh, and it's for the purpose that the church would be the instrument through which God makes known his multifarious wisdom. And this is according to his eternal purpose, which he hid uh, and is now being revealed through the church and revealed especially through Paul's ministry. Okay, so the ministry is about this knowledge of Christ that is our, uh, our handling of the riches of Christ, which is the inheritance uh, among the children of God. And it becomes in us and in them a weight of glory, um, wrought in them an eternal weight of glory. And they become epistles of Christ with a writing that never fades. And this is what 2 Corinthians is about, is this ministry, this glorious ministry of the Spirit which gives life, which actually imparts the knowledge of the glory of God which is shining in the face of Christ as a weight of glory into the saints. And this is the context where Paul said, I work more than they all, yet not I, but the grace of Christ in me. What is the grace of Christ? The grace is of his fullness we've received, grace upon grace. Grace is God himself in Christ, shining upon us, renewing us in the knowledge of Christ, and then being that knowledge is testified and witnessed and declared through the New Testament ministry of the apostles. Like John said, these uh, the, that which we heard which was from the beginning, the word of life, which we handled, which our eyes have seen, our ears have heard, our hands have handled, right? It's manifested in the flesh. We declare to you so that you may have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the Father uh, and with his son, Jesus Christ. And we write these things that, you may, that your joy may be full. The declaration of the riches of Christ is the ministry, uh, which brings to us the knowledge of Jesus Christ and brings us into the fellowship Okay, And the fellowship is the enjoyment of Christ as the allotted portion of the saints in light. So Colossians says that God has qualified, we are giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us for a share of the allotted portion of the saints in the light. There's an allotted portion which is called the inheritance. That's a word from the Old Testament where they would talk about the land that was divvied up among the tribes. Well, we have a good land, which is Christ himself in his unsearchable riches that has been given to us as an inheritance. And the goal of the Christian life is to know him in the power of his resurrection and to gain him, not just individually, but also corporately because he is the allotted portion of the saints in light, which means he's our inheritance. He's our crown, our reward, our shield, and our inheritance. He's the goal of the Christian life. He's our righteousness. He's our life. He's our sanctification. And he's our goal, our pursuit. Okay, we are pursuing the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And that knowledge is not just doctrinal knowledge. It's actually a weight of glory as he shines in our heart and illuminates us and writes himself and works himself into us. Uh, this is a hidden thing in this age. It's a treasure in the earthen vessel. But in the next age, it'll be fully revealed. And God has given ministers for the equipping of the saints under this ministry. And we all have a part in the ministry. Okay, And the ministry is the building up of the body of Christ. So he says he gave some apostles, evangelists, shepherds, po uh, teachers for the equipping of the saints under the work of the ministry unto the building up of the body of Christ until we come to the full knowledge of of the Son of God, the unity of the faith, and the full knowledge of the Son of God, under the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ, that we would no longer be babes tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. So it's a growth in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, but it's corporate. And this knowledge is the building up of the body of Christ. And it's a similar to his prayer in Ephesians 3, where he prays that God would strengthen you into the inner man according to the riches of his glory, that Christ would make his home in your heart through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love would be able to apprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ, to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. Uh, and that's with the saints that you may be filled unto the fullness of God. Now to him who's able to do exceeding abundant beyond what you can ask or think, to him be glory, uh, according to the power which works in us, to him be glory in the church forever and in Christ Jesus. This is the inheritance that is being presently built, okay? And in Ephesians 1, 
uh, Paul refers to the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. He prays that we have a spirit of wisdom and revelation to know what is the hope of his calling, which is Christ's calling, and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Christ has an inheritance in the saints. Well, it's really the Father's inheritance, and we have also obtained an inheritance. Where is that inheritance? It's in the saints. It's the new city, Jerusalem, the city whose builder and maker is God. Christ is a son faithful over this house whose house we are. And this house is being built in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, with Christ himself as the foundation, and then we need to be careful how we build. And so we need to build by living Christ and working in grace, so that it is not I that live and we work, but not I, but Christ, but the grace of Christ in me. So we live, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ in me, but we also work, but it's not I, but the grace of Christ in me. And that is how we build. If you don't see Christ as life, you're not going to be able to build. And if you do build, it's going to be wood, hay, and stubble. And so, yes, there's a suffering of loss, according to 1 Corinthians 3, which means that that which you built was burned up. Everything you invested yourself in is gone. None of it makes it through the fire. It's all a waste. Because you built living I not Christ. You did not cross out the flesh. You didn't see that it, this Christian life has to be not I, but Christ. And then you worked and not the grace of Christ. You tried most likely to work for a wage and you tried to put God in your debt, working as if he was going to pay you for your service, but you had no interest in the building itself. The reward is the building. The, the inheritance and the reward are the same thing. Because Paul said, are you not our crown of rejoicing at his coming? It's the, the work is working Christ into the saints. Uh, that's what the ministry is for. All the ministries were given for the building up of the body of Christ. And yes, there is a reward for ministry. And Paul said, or well, the writer of Hebrews said, that God is not unjust to forget your service and you've served the saints course he's going to he's looking for opportunities to reward you if you gave a glass of water to a disciple in the name of a disciple he's generous he's gonna you will not lose your reward you're gonna be amazed at how much there is in the new city of jerusalem and each thing that he remembers will be remembered forever as a memorial we don't have any concept of a reward that never fades you know i mentioned my grand piano as the example of a reward uh, of something that i have that always gets better over time everything else like a cell phone I'm, by the time i have to set it up i'm ready to throw the dang thing away everything in this world fades but when there's something that you can use forever that you grow with it and it grows with you that's something amazing and that's what the new city jerusalem is and the saints and the fellowship and the riches of christ's glory of his inheritance in the saints which is the result of the travail of his soul and he will see the travail of his soul and be satisfied and we will cast all our crowns at his feet because we will see that his reward this is his reward and he says i behold i come and my reward is with me there's no punishment at the bema seat there's no punishment or judgment. You're not under the law, nor is there a wage for you to work for as if God is in your debt to pay you to work for him out in the field. No, there is the satisfaction in the fellowship and the knowledge of Jesus Christ that causes us to run to him and we count everything as done to pursue the excellency of the knowledge of Christ and then out of that knowledge we become stewards of the riches of Christ and we dispense him as life and light into the saints who and that becomes our building work and that will be remembered but we have to remember that he who plants and he who waters is nothing it is God who gives the increase and we're not doing it motivated by a wage. We're doing it because we love the building. You know, an architect and an engineer and a builder and all the people who work on a project, like I went, to, we have the arch in St. Louis uh, and there's a museum down at the bottom of the arch and the museum is a memorial to the people who participated. And it's got videos of all the things they did and everything. And what they're excited about is not their paycheck but the finished product. Some of them put their lives on the line. There were a couple people that died building this crazy thing. But it was such a unique project and such a beautiful 
uh, thing they were making that they were all excited about it from the planners to the investors to the city to the everybody who was in part of it okay and when it was unveiled at the end of the work everybody who was involved was applauding and applauded and that's how this is gonna go okay that's what we're gonna see we're gonna be applauded and applauded and that's why he says every man will have their own praise and we, we, we don't judge before it's time but no, this is not about law. And see, what people want to do is they want to hijack the beautiful reward of the inheritance and make it into the carrot stick system and use it to bring people back under law and into bondage. And that is worth fighting for. That is not a secondary issue. Um, and this is not about drama between channels. I hate when people come and say, oh, I'm so grieved to see the drama and the hostility between brothers and Christ. No, this has nothing to do with that. If a channel owner can should stand by their doctrine and be prepared to suffer for what they teach, especially if they're convicted that what they are sharing is their ministry. No, I don't care about the channels. What we care about is who is affected by our teaching and are we willing to contend for our teaching? Are we just going to be a lukewarm mix where we try to love all the institutions at the expense of the sheep and tell the sheep, well, you're just going to have to deal because I love this guy no matter what he says. And uh, I'm going to be uni unified with, with him. Uh, and you're not allowed to say anything about this teaching. You're just going to have to go find your own way. No, not at all. Um, and some people say, well, you're, you're fighting and that causes problems for the evangelical effort. No. Paul went into the synagogues first to overthrow the reason and and same with like reformation all through church history whenever there was a big revival that it was through an overthrowing of the present religious ideas which always produces a resistance from the old guard they'll always resist and fight you know i didn't come out teaching reward to go uh, what i teach about reward to go to attack any channels no it's after a while they start getting offended at what i teach and then they start doing videos and calling radio shows and then coming and rebuking me on my wall and then i finally respond and then somebody comes and says oh i'm so grieved to see the hostility between brothers it's like well, why aren't you mad at what these people are saying to the saints? Why aren't you grieved about how this doctrine has brought people into bondage? You're so worried about one brother and his channel? Why aren't you worried about what this does to people who are brought into captivity? Well, somebody needs to speak against it and, 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 and have a righteous anger about the things that bring us into bondage so that people can see, hey, this is not the... The status quo is not what I have to accept. I don't have to be in bondage to men. And as they get free, it's worth it, you know? And uh, that's what I'm really concerned about. Not keeping peace between channels. I, I really could care less anymore about the channels. I'll stand all alone if I have to uh, as a channel. We are not here for channels. This is not a playground for channel owners. We are supposed to be servants to the people who are sitting at table to eat we're just stewards uh so okay that's just what i wanted to say about that you know so i cannot present my full view on rewards in five minutes and i know people want me to do that sometimes you're going to hear me talk about it and you're going to think he's saying that we don't even have a reward other times you're going to hear me saying it sounds like he says we are working for a reward well it's all a matter of how do you approach this is it law or grace wages carrot and stick and retribution and punishments that's law or there's something glorious secured by justification that we are all a part of and it's Christ's work and he's sharing it with us but he also gave us the opportunity to participate in its building miraculously because he knows that's fun too and we're all going to celebrate the finished product and there will be a memorial to everyone's participation. Some people have built something that doesn't make it at the end. It's like you built a little shack next to the building and it got burned in the fire. Sorry, you suffered the loss of that thing, but you're not going to be upset. You'll be there at the New Jerusalem rejoicing as well because you'll enjoy the allotted portion of the saints in light. You're just as qualified as we are. Just won't have your name or whatever it is. You know, I'm not going to say we fully understand the reward. It's a mystery. If you say it's not a mystery and you've got it all figured out, uh, that's not 
that's that's silly because we're talking about things in resurrection that are eternal and spiritual and we're carnal we see in part so uh i just wanted to kind of put a caveat on this last two messages to say hey I'm not going to be able to give my complete full orb picture of rewards in one message and don't judge my whole teaching on rewards by that. I have a playlist where I do get into various aspects, but no, if you attach it to punishment and loss and wages and debts, you are on the law track and you're in the flesh and you're building with wood, hay, and stubble and you really need to see as the root, not I but Christ, and then not I but the grace of Christ in me as the uh, principle for the Christian life and then service. Then you can see what building is and what the precious materials are that we're to build with. Um, and then you can talk about reward. <laughs> so there's a lot of givens. There's a lot of things that have to be taken for granted before you can even talk about reward. And that's why it's such a complex uh, subject. Okay, I got to get going. I tried to talk fast, but it ended up in 30 minutes. So take care.